aspects. Um, I come from a, a medical background and basically a, it's a, uh, what I'm about to ask is a statement as well as a question. Um, what are you going to do to improve? Um, I've heard you speak about um, how you were going to um, go about improving healthcare in Zambia. Um, I'm a nurse and I'm an intensive care nurse who, um, who have seen the benefits of um, people and, um, and how well they do with very, good, very, very basic um, uh, equipments and, 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 and services. And uh, when I go to Zambia, it's very, very, um, I feel very sad when I visit the UTH. Um, I stood uh, brought in dead one time waiting for my uncle for an hour and I, th I saw 30 bodies brought in dead at that particular time. Um, we don't have a cardiac arrest facility at, um, in Zambia at the moment and um, some of my relatives had to uh, uh, take some dead bodies from, from the UTH to, to the mortuary on their own. Um, there's a lot of work I think and it's, uh, our healthcare is way below standard and it is very appalling. And also what are we doing about um, our president health touring and other political members touring? What, who, who has a voice for the basic Zambian who cannot get a flight when they're sick to go outside of the country and seek Thank you. Can I, can I also add a a question yeah. here, which I think comes, comes from that. I mean, you, you're a, a, a businessman, and when you are president, do you think you might be in danger of being perceived as having a conflict of interest? And would you therefore consider putting your businesses into a blind trust while you, while you were president? <laughs> Public order access, what will we do? I, I, I think I did touch on it a little bit when I was making a presentation. Uh, yes, the Public Order Act is a piece of legislation comes from our colonial heritage. Mainly at the time it was meant to restrict uh, you know, uh, people of color from uh, moving freely in case they engage in, in uh, organized work that may lead to independence. Uh, that's understood, but uh, over time the Public Order Act has been amended. I think positive amendments have been made to it. Uh, for example, one controversial aspect is that uh, if we need, as UPND, to hold a meeting, um, we need to notify the police seven days before the meeting. Please take note of the selection of words I'm using. We need to notify the police <coughs> about our intentions awarding a public meeting at least seven days before the meeting is held. So, but over time, this was not an issue. Under the MMD leadership, this was not an issue. Uh, MMD and uh, President Chiluba, the late Chiluba, may so rest in peace, the late Manawasa, it was not an issue. President Bandes was not an issue. It only became an issue when PF came into office, my brother. Maybe these are the good things PF has done. <laughs> that the interpretation was changed to that you need a permit to assemble. You don't need a permit. It was never intended to, to be interpreted that way. But the PF, in fact, I think some of my detentions are having to do with having a meeting which was not authorized. And we saw this draconian negative interpretation of the Public Order Act under the PF. As the law stands, it's not a big issue. And I think when PF leaves office in 16 months' time, courts help, and um, through an election, for us, that interpretation must not be questioned, which means that we will probably have to amend the act to make it very, very clear, and that no one would take advantage of any perceived ambiguity in the interpretation of the law, so that people can have their freedoms. This time, I mean, are these the times that you can restrict people's movements? Yeah. Especially for democratic reasons or to visit their relative, uh, indoor meetings? Absolutely not. Yeah. So I think that prior to the 20 January 2015 elections, even the performance you've seen was against the backdrop of these restrictions arising from the interpretation of the public order. I don't think we should continue that. If we need to redraft the whole law, 
then we will do that to make it clear. The um, diverse question, question agriculture. I think agriculture is, my done all great potential for our country. Agriculture is a, is a great employer, large employer, if it's structured properly. Some of the distortions in our agricultural sector is really arises from the cost of production. And I think in our uh, manifesto, we've been talking about looking at lowering the cost of production from inputs. I think so. Of course, you can talk about obvious technical issues of efficiencies. I know. Yield per hectare, per hectare. But there is a big issue on the cost of inputs, which we would like to focus on, but also to get on to agro-processing. I mean, Congo consumes a lot of mail. Why sell maize to Congo? Why not sell melanin to Congo? So that you can retain jobs in the milling subset. Why sell maize to Botswana? instead of stock feed to Botswana. These are basic issues. And when you have a stock feed in an aspect of your agriculture, then you assure the raw producers of the market <coughs> for their produce. We also have problems to rely on the rain-fed crop. This year, the crop has failed. Those of us in agriculture know rain-fed crop has failed. We can improve the yield assurance to irrigation. To do that, we need to allocate resources to support farmers in acquiring capacity for irrigation. You all are aware that, those of you who are close to Zambia, that we are safe to control 35 to 40% of fresh water in the Sadiq region. So what are we doing with that water? Are we harvesting it? No. Again, back to the question of leadership. You can't run away from the question of leadership. To create opportunities in the agriculture sector that will make investment, investing in that sector attractive. Retail, market, financing of agriculture, marketing, storage, all of that. I don't want to bore you tonight. Yeah. The health sector. I want to agree with you, madam. This is a disaster. The health sector in Zambia is a disaster, a total disaster. Health service delivery has collapsed by and large. UTH is a place I go into regularly. Regular visits in the evening in a casual ward, in the admission wards. The first thing that you face when you go out there, it's just the hygiene. Before you talk of equipment, which you're talking about, just the hygiene. You then wonder, how do these people come out healed mm -hmm. out of this place? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is not, it is not fun. But again, it comes to resource allocations, priorities, connected to economic performance. How do you generate money to invest in the health sector? Yes, there's a private health se service sector, health sector. But what about the population that are not able to pay fully for those services? But the, the, the beauty of these things is that if you manage your private health se sector properly, common minimum standards with the public health sector delivery public, in not, not the way the people here will understand it, not a listed company, but state on <coughs> to take care of those who are less privileged, less able to afford private medical services. But if you don't support the private health, health sector, sector, you are actually encumbering the public health sector as well. Because you are, you are failing to offload some of the population that can go into private health facilities. I agree with you. I think arguing or debating this issue with you is not fair. 
I agree with you. It can be made better. I think as a party, we are clear of our intentions in the health sector, as we are in education. By the way, for the issue of agriculture, you know, there are protocols Zambia is failing to, to fulfill. The Maputo protocol, study protocol on agriculture, it tells that each of the study countries must invest not less than 10% of their annual budget in agriculture, as they've, I think, done that in education and health. We're not meeting many of those. Why? Because we're spending money extravagantly on elections, by elections. I think you are aware that since PF came into office, my brother there, <laughs> my colleague here, conflict of interest. I think this can be an issue, but it's a non-issue. Because if you improve the sector attractiveness, you're not doing it for what I mean, small business. You're doing it if you improve the agricultural sector attractiveness. There are bigger people who will invest, bigger businesses who will invest in agriculture. More than my little uh, big production. <laughs> you see? But also, I'm a believer that uh, we are seeking public office not to go and make politics an enterprise exercise, <coughs> to profit from politics. We fundamentally believe that those seeking public office, especially to our level, at the presence in, in, in Zambia and in Africa, must have alternative income, gainful income, outside politics. <laughs> the reason is that you are going to go there and work on improving the economy and sectors. And if the sector grows, I'll be very happy because if Zambians disposable incomes increase, they will buy more of my beef. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there'll be corruption in there. <laughs> Frankly speaking, the, the potential for corruption is higher on those politicians who have no alternative income and, and seek public office as a business. Let me be blunt here. I am not, I am not a professional politician. I don't want to be a professional politician. I think the vice is associated with professional politics at least for Africa, have proven to be fatal to the population. The appetite for corruption is high. The appetite for nepotism, the appetite for sustaining, reinventing oneself in office so that you can end up with the president's retirement home. Frankly speaking, if you are seeking the president and you want the taxpayer in a compound to build you a $5 million home, there must be something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> Leaders in Africa must be assisting citizens to build homes, to acquire homes, not to be in front of the queue. <laughs> I think it's a shame. I would rather be a businessman. I would rather encourage business people to enter politics because of their financial independence. They are likely to challenge what I call routine in African politics. How do you help each other to stay in office, yet the economy is dysfunctional? I think we should have more professionals going into politics perform their national service, missionary work, come out and make tea for you, sir. <laughs> okay. Right. Very, very quick questions now. Very quick ones. Over. So, yeah, Oh. <laughs> I, I, Mr. Moderator, I deliberately right. avoided that, actually. All right. Okay. Uh, but, but I can be fair to them if you, don't, if you allow me. Sure. The, 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 But how do you 
hope to create the prosperity that will cut across the Italian society. Why I ask this question is yeah, because... No, it's okay, that's a very good question. It, it yes, is a good question, right. but because the country are, is faced with a chronic poverty, which poverty can be felt in all sectors of our society. Now, people have gone into office to amass wealth. And because of that, we find that it's not been easy for uh, politicians, as HH indicated, that some people get into politics in order to access uh, big money. How does he hope to make sure that those that are in leadership in uh, his government are uh, prevented from corrupt practices, as is the case in this part of the world? All right, that's fine. That's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Richard, Richard. Yes, all right. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. My question is uh, a quick one. Um, it's regarding the issue of uh, dual citizenship. And this is the, sh the issue that has actually impeded a lot of skills transfer. Yeah. And most of the examples that you are seeing here actually have dual nationality secretly. Because, for example, I'm doing my PhD. <laughs> I'm doing my PhD. Okay, okay. In very quickly. Just <laughs> come to your question. Okay, so what's your take on dual nationality? Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Okay, Mr. HH, there is a recognition in Africa and in Zambia in general that the presidency has got too much power. Yeah. When you become president in 2016, because it's not a question of if, what powers of presidency are you going to give up? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the colleague on the what will we do to um, um, ensure development across the country. I think this is the subject of tonight's conversation. Mm -hmm. we, we've said it and said it over and over that uh, it's, a, it's a quality of leadership uh, which will answer that paradox of uh, poor people in a rich country. It's a police choices, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's the ability to implement, to follow through those policies and um, ensure effective implementation. Uh, but really, you have to create to support investment. You have to support business success. There's, there are no other ways. They're not there. The isms don't matter anymore in our environment. Communism, socialism, those issues don't matter anymore. What matter are basic issues of job creation, business opportunities. So you can look after the Less privilege. There's no other way. Economic money, leadership. The issue of um, presidents flying out when they're ill. I, I, I was actually deliberate in omitting that because I don't want uh, a major headline in Zambia out of this presentation to be on HH says the president is sick and uh, he's flown to China for medical treatment. <laughs> because that's what it will be. And that's what it's been. And leaving the issues that are important that we've discussed uh, tonight, um, you see. But uh, frankly speaking, it's a responsibility of, responsibility of leadership to improve health services delivery. For you as a nurse, health services delivery is not just a medicine. For citizens of Zambia, and other, any citizens anyway, it's not just the medicine, it's not just the equipment. It's also looking after the, the health providers, like you. Many of you are here because you're not well looked after in Zambia. The brain drain causing shortages, the nurse to patient ratio in our country is unacceptably high. No way one nurse can look after 200 patients. In different words, how possible is that? It doesn't matter how good you are. So these are issues that can only be again dealt with if we improve health services delivery. 
the institutional side, the building, the brick and mortar, the equipment, the medicines, and, and also the providers, health service providers. But it's still a function of ability to fund the health sector. Still a function of the business success, economic success. I return to this subject, because that's my intention tonight, to show, to argue that if you can't run your economy properly, you cannot run other sectors properly. I think that's my message. Voters didn't pay attention to us for a long time. My predecessor, Andy Mazoka, carried the same message. The party, UPND, has been consistent. Now the voters have realized that the rhetoric of 90 days can never deliver anything. You've got to return to the basics. And I think that's why you see our momentum is, is strong. Um, the issue, I think, of answer the poverty reduction, the dual citizenship. You're very courageous to say what you've said. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have said it. I would have said it in a different way. <laughs> no, no, no. The point I'm making is different. It's, 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 it's their stay here. I mean, if, if you illegally carry it, but, but I don't want to repeat it in case it, <laughs> in, in, in case it draws their attention. I think it's important uh, uh, in today's world, really, to consider dual citizenship. Yeah. Very, yes. important. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. To consider it positively. Earlier, I was talking about uh, the value of the diaspora, the skills, the networking, the capital raising, um, uh, the experiences that can be brought to bear in our countries. I'm aware that uh, many of you who live outside Zambia have been ridiculed by the PF government, that you, <laughs> that you are, you are traitors. <laughs> I, I would not treat you as traitors. We have uh, non-citizens living in Zambia, doing business, investing, taking a risk in our country. And I think uh, the global village entails thinking different about how you view citizens outside of your country. The people have no jobs, like those graduates who were demonstrated and are in sales. If they got an opportunity for a job outside the Zambia, outside Zambia, won't they take the opportunity? Yes. I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs means food, job, looking after your children, shelter, it's very important. So you cannot talk of uh, being a traitor. I think it's associated to the subject of the question. You have asked dual citizenship. The um, presidential powers. I was trying to look, who is this person speaking? I was going yeah. over it. And, and you are just seated there uh, next to me. Those that have followed the constitutional making process in Zambia understand that one of the fundamental provisions in the draft constitution is separation of powers to ensure that overriding powers of the executive over the judiciary, over the legislature, should be curtailed. I hope um, my colleague, Mr. Machila, is here, Honorable Machila, is here. The, the, the executive in the definition of, uh, through the Zambian constitution, is the president. The president constitutes the executive. Everyone else works for him and is his appointee, isn't it? To a large extent. So it means the executive's powers are overbearing. And it's not an issue of HH's design. It's an issue of balancing the equation. The, the president's the executive is too strong. President, if you're a Zambian, can detain you without reason. Without reason. I don't think David Cameron can detain a British citizen <laughs> in the same manner. I think that's why we need a new constitution. And that's why we needed it delivered like yesterday. And many people argue on this subject that you can't eat a constitution. That's what the PF is saying, my friend. That if you want a new constitution, you need food, not a new constitution. Constitution is a piece of paper. 
That's what the PF said. After promising us the constitution in 90 days, they formed government. They said, no, this is a piece of it. You need food more than a constitution. Food is in the constitution. <laughs> Limited powers of the president are in the draft constitution. Mm -hmm. Earlier I was talking about debt here. Eight billion dollars plus. There is no control over executive how much debt they acquire and for what use they apply. There's nothing. We would like to see that in the new constitution. To instill <coughs> some responsibility in those that take public office with an extravagant mind. Thank you. I think we could have quite comfortably gone on for another hour. The questions <laughs> um, Thank you so much for answering them so directly. And I, I don't take this the wrong way, but you don't sound like a politician. Yeah, it was really enlightening, and I think I think we've all enjoyed it. So a big hand.